Last week, we began a new series called Repentance and Renewal, Realign Your Heart with God's Heart. We talked about the story of Jonah, and uh, I just need to give you a little bit of of insight into what it's like to prepare a message. Um, I really enjoyed preparing last week's message and preaching last week's message, and, and, and more than one of you said to me, this is kind of weird to say, but I feel like it was your best message ever. And I appreciate that. And so I wrote this one for today and I sent it to Laura, my wife, and I said, give me any feedback you've got. And she goes, it's a bit boring. (laughs) How do you back up after Jonah? Uh, And so what I wanna do today is is share a boring message with you. No, what we're gonna do is is understand a little bit more of, of behind the scenes of repentance. You know, in Jonah's life is this perfect living picture of what repentance looks like and what repentance doesn't look like. And, and sometimes repentance comes like it, it, it did for us last week, a bit of a gut punch of, of realization and heart change and heart realignment. And, and other times it's slower. Other times it's more subtle and it's more in our heads. Uh, and we'll talk about what the word repentance means and what that looks like in our lives. And I'll do my best to not put you to sleep uh, with a, a boring message. Um, but let's start in Luke 24. It's Easter Sunday, the first Easter Sunday that evening. And Jesus' disciples are gathered in a room and the doors are locked. And two of them are telling the the, the rest of them, we have seen Jesus. He met us on the road as we were walking and then he broke bread in front of us and disappeared. And, And the other disciples want to believe them because still more, the women had said that they had seen Jesus early in the day. So they're going, well, two, two groups now are saying you've seen Jesus. They wanna believe, but they don't quite. They're afraid and they have doubts. And so Jesus all of a sudden appears. As, as quickly as he disappeared earlier that day, he appears, jump scare, surprise, I am really here. And he says, don't be frightened, I'm not a ghost. And don't doubt, but here you can look at my hands and, and touch them, the holes, and you can look at my feet and touch them, and, and, and you can see that I'm not a ghost. And he says in verse 41 of Luke 24, it says, still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. And then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. Um, bro- I don't know if you've ever eaten broiled fish. I had to look it up. I'm like, this does not sound good. Um, but it just means roasted from one direction. I can get on board with that. At first I was thinking, that's what he asked for? Like, has anyone got a Snickers bar? Or something might've been better, but he asked for a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. There's some things that the disciples needed that day. They needed the physical evidence that Jesus was alive. They knew he was dead. There was no doubt about that. They needed to know now that he was alive again. And so the touching and the hearing and then seeing him eat food was all sim- signified to them. He really was alive. But they also needed some answers. What does this all mean? How did this happen? And so let's keep reading in verse 46. And Jesus said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. He'd been trying to tell them, they didn't get it. So now they'd seen it, he reminds them, this is what was written. He's talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the the book and the books they knew. And he said, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And here's the message, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent, repent, repentance and renewal. The word repent when you see it in the Bible comes from an ancient Greek word, which is what the New Testament is written in mainly. It's the word metanoia. It doesn't just mean repent. It means to change your mind, to change your thinking, and it means to turn around. And so if you're following Google Maps in your car or, or whatever GPS or maps you have and, and you're, you're following the map but you miss a turn or you take a wrong turn, the GPS has to metanoia. It has to change its mind and turn around and then lead you on the right path from there so you can get to your destination. 
Now, we talked about Jonah last week. He's in the belly of the fish and he has a metanoia moment or a metanoia experience. He changes his mind and his heart towards God. And then there's also a turning around physically. He's ready now to go and do what God had asked him to do. But by the end of the story of Jonah, there is no metanoying. That's not a word. There's no repenting. Jonah has not changed his mind and heart about who God is. He can't get his head around the fact that God loves the people of Nineveh. And so there's no repenting in his mind and there's no repenting in his life. There's no turning around. He's just stuck in this one direction. And so in your car, while Google Maps can repent and Google Maps can change and turn around, it's more accurate to say that you, the driver, need to change your mind and realize you're going in the wrong direction. And then you're able to accept that you need to turn around and go in a different direction. So that's what it means. If you see the word repent in the Bible, it means to think differently, think again and turn around. Turn around in your mind and turn around in your life. So am I going the wrong way? Then I need to realize that. I need to realize that and turn around. Am I doing the wrong thing? then I need to realize that and I need to turn around. And is my heart out of alignment with God that I need to realize that and turn around. So it's not just behavior. It's not just a change of behavior. It's also a change on the inside. But it's not just a change on the inside. It's also a change of action and behavior on the outside. Genuine repentance is when the two go together. There's an inner repentance and an outer repentance. Now, we have a practice guide for this whole series. You can grab a, a printed copy from the info desk after the service or right now, get the digital version, scan or tap the link in. And that's got resources for you as an individual, for your family together and your small group together to unpack more about what repentance and renewal looks like in your life. A month or so ago, I went down to Victoria to celebrate with my granddad for his 90th birthday. And uh, he, we went together on a houseboat on the Murray River in Echuca. And so we motored up and down the river, exploring and fishing and, and spending time together. And each morning I got up and went for a run by myself. And I figured it was pretty straightforward. You know, the first morning I, I get up and, and you just walk out onto the bank and you turn right or left. And then you go as far as you want to go. And then you just turn around and you come back. But as I started running on that first morning, I had this distance in mind. Once I get to this point, I'll turn around. But the way the river was bending and the, the direction it was changing in my mind, I was looping around. And, and surely any moment now, I'm going to hit a road that I know will lead us straight back to where our boat is moored or, or lead me back to where our boat was moored. It, it must be just around the next bend of the river just around the next bend of the river. It's, I'm going way further than I intended, but I know it must be just around the next. And I kept rationalizing it to myself. Like, I, I know I've changed direction. The sun's in a different spot. If I go this way, I know that I'll find the road soon and then I'll be able to loop back. It's not that bad. It's not that far. I'm not that lost. I'm not that out of breath. I can keep going. And, and it wasn't until I finally got a couple of bars of reception on my phone and I was able to look at the map that I realized the Murray River is not the only river in town. There's also the Goulburn River. And so somehow I'd missed the junction and I was now following the Goulburn River in the wrong direction and going further and further away from where I thought I was and I needed to be. I needed to repent. It started on the inside. I needed to realize that I had a problem and then physically I needed to turn around. And so I could see on the map that there was a road, not at all the road that I thought was supposed to be there, but a different one that eventually would get me back. And so I was able to, to find that road and then physically turn around. But I could have made my whole life a lot less painful if I'd repented earlier if I'd admitted that I had a problem and I needed to turn around. And we do this with sin. Sin separates us from God and sin causes damage between us as people and it hurts us as well, but we ignore it and we rationalize it. it it's not that bad. Or we, we double down. I, I am not. No, I didn't. 
You know, we, we see this with young kids. My parents were telling the story the other day of when my brother learned to write his own name. And so they'd find autographs in crayon all over the house on the walls. And so they'd bring him over and say, did you do this? You know, it's your handwriting with a crayon. And, and he would just flat out deny it. I, no, no, I did not do that. No repentance. But it's not just kids. It's, it's also me. It may also be you as well. I, I double down. I harden my heart. And I ignore or I rationalize or, or I minimize it or I just flat out deny what I've done. And sometimes that's because I just don't see it yet or I just don't understand it yet. And, and sometimes it's because I don't want to admit it. I don't want to face up to it. I don't want to change my mind. I don't want to turn around and repent. And I'm sure you can think of times in your life when your sin has been revealed to you. You may have realized it by yourself or the Holy Spirit within you has pointed it out. God might have shown you or someone else might have pointed out your sin to you, but, but you deny, deny, deny and double down rather than repenting. On Good Friday, we read this passage from 1 John chapter 1. He says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to Him, to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. We all have a problem with sin and doubling down, rationalizing, minimizing, and even trying harder is not the answer to our problem. The real answer lies in Jesus who has the power to do something about it. Now, we've been talking about the word repent, but you need to know that there are writers in the New Testament, you know, individuals who wrote lots of letters and even gospels about Jesus' life who don't use the word at all. And John is one of those, does not ever use the word repent on Jesus' lips or even in his own writing of letters. Now, it's not because he doesn't think it's important, he just explains it in a different way. And so John, the, the apostle, and John who wrote the, the book and the letters, he would be a terrible street preacher. You know, they live off the word repent through the megaphone, through the portable PA. You know, you'd never book John as your stadium crusade preacher. They live off the word repent as well, but John doesn't ever use it. So it's not the word that's important. The word repentance isn't the most important thing. It's the, the attitude and the change, the turning. And so what John talks about is confessing our sins and receiving forgiveness. So at the start of the next chapter, he says in, in chapter two, verse one, he says, my dear children, I'm writing this to you, this letter to you, so that you will not sin. That's what he wants for, for us as we read it now, to not sin, but he knows that we will. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. Who? Who's this advocate? He's Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. So repenting to John is first and foremost changing your mind about Jesus. It's changing your mind to go, I have a sin problem and I know that Jesus is the answer to my sin problem. John was one of the people that saw Jesus eat the fish. So he knew Jesus wasn't just a great guy who taught good things. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And so John gives these three quick analogies to explain how and why and, and how it all works. And so he says, Jesus is the advocate who pleads our case before the Father. When we're facing the consequences of our sin, we don't know what to say. We don't have the standing, we don't have the skills. Jesus stands with us and advocates for us. He speaks when we don't have the words. He has the skills and the ability and the standing to be our advocate and He does. Yes, she sinned. And yes, she's admitted the problem and I'm here advocating for her. Now. It's important to understand that God the Father and Jesus the Son are not at each other here. Jesus isn't petitioning the Father who is, is wanting to do something to you because Jesus came from the Father, 
they're, they're one, one heart, one mind. Jesus is how God loves us. And so they're not against each other in this, but they're playing different roles in this uh, reality and, and in the pages of the Bible, the, the drama of the reality of sin and the reality of our forgiveness. So Jesus advocates for us. He's the way that God shows his love to us. Now, a second change of mind is realizing that Jesus is the Christ. He's the one who is truly righteous. Jesus is the one God promised, the one God provided, the only human being to ever be truly righteous and perfect. We are not, we cannot, but Jesus is and he did. And finally, Jesus is the sacrifice that atones for our sins and the sins of all the world. Atonement is just making things right. He makes things right between us and God because he's our advocate, because he's righteous, because he's perfect. He's able to be that sacrifice when no one else can and we never could for ourselves. And the offer is for the whole world if only they would accept. So repentance is to change your mind, to think again about your problem with sin and to think again about Jesus as the solution. And we can confess our sin to him because he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. So first of all, repentance is a, is a one-time thing for our eternal cleansing, our eternal forgiveness, our eternal salvation. Because we have a problem with sin, we need Jesus to do this for us, to, to remove the impact of that sin and to give us life today and forever. He's the only one who can. So John writes in chapter two, he says, sorry, chapter five near the end of the letter, he says, this is what God has testified. He's given us eternal life and his life is in his son. So whoever has the son has life. And whoever doesn't have the Son does not have life. And so before I continue, we need to check in on this big one-time repentance, the big one-time changing of your mind and your heart. Have you accepted that you need this? Have you accepted that Jesus is the only one who can do this for you? Or are you still running along the river thinking that you know the way, and eventually it will work out for you by yourself. Jesus offers forgiveness and life to you today. He can restore your relationship with God. He can promise you life forever and give you purpose and renewal. I'm gonna lead us in prayer in a couple of minutes when I finish. And for someone today, this may be the repentance that you need this changing your mind about your sin problem and Jesus as the only solution. So there's the one-time repentance, but then repentance is also there for us as an ongoing thing, as a regular thing, as an everyday thing to keep the closeness of our relationship with God and the health of our relationship with God. So, so back in chapter two in his letter, John writes, and now dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you'll be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Now, the word fellowship is not even the word that John uses here. Um, he uses the word abide or remain in, remain in Christ. But for some reason, the translators thought this was a good way for us to understand it. Um, good, except that fellowship these days is pretty much only a Christian word. Um, we don't really use it anywhere else in, in our life unless you're a fan of the Lord of the Rings and the fellowship of the ring. Frodo, Legolas, Aragorn, Gandalf, and, and the rest, they have this fellowship with, with their, their shared purpose around how special that ring is. And, and, and their fellowship, it doesn't just come from the day that they committed to each other, that they would carry on this task. Their fellowship happens in their day-to-day -day interactions with the squabbles that they have, with the fears that come up, with the pride that needs confronting. That's how the, the fellowship plays out, is in the day-to-day -day working out of their relationships. They have to stay together. They have to remain with each other and abide with each other. And, and that's what John says. 
We have to do that with Jesus. So yes, once for all time, there's this commitment and forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness, but also in our day-to-day lives, we need to remain with Christ or in fellowship with Christ. And, and this is the kind of ongoing repentance with God that leads to the, the fruit that the Spirit brings out of us, love, and joy, and peace. It's, it's not letting issues build up between us and God. It's, it's confessing those things and receiving forgiveness for those things so that we can remain in closeness, so our hearts can be aligned with Him. You know, it's saying, God, I, I realize what I've done. Or I know what I've been doing and I know it's been keeping me from you or making me try and run and hide to get away from you. And I'm sorry. I thank you that you've already forgiven me in advance. And so I don't wanna continue doing this thing. I receive your forgiveness and I wanna now turn around and go in a different direction, a new direction with you. That's ongoing repentance. And so... It's the same in my marriage. I got married to Laura 17 years ago and I could show you the certificate and I have the, the ring, the, fel- fellowship, the fellowship of our rings. But that's not, not enough just to lean on that. There's ongoing fellowship that we need and part of that in, in our marriage is repentance and forgiveness. It means when I sin against Laura, if I double down and I ignore it or deny it, or, or refuse to accept what I've done, that, that does terrible things to the closeness of our relationship. We could stay married with that stuff going on, but it would not be a very enjoyable life together. But if I'm willing to, to repent, to change the way I think and to change the way I'm living my life, then we're able to not just stay in a marriage relationship, but to have marriage fellowship and closeness and love and joy and all of those things. So repentance is first and foremost between us and God, but it also has something to do with our relationships with each other. And, and sometimes we need help to work that out. Sometimes friends need to point things out to us or we need friends to help us get along with each other or, or counsellors or mediators to help us work things out between us. And sometimes we need expert help. Sometimes because one or both of us isn't really repenting, we need lawyers to help us work these things out. And where there's really um, hurtful, impacting sin, and where there's a power differential between people, that's where we need authority figures and we need the police. These things are all part of getting along with each other, and that's important. But there are a whole bunch of just everyday, smaller ways that we need to repent and work things out between us and God and between us and each other. So let me give you this summary verse from a different book in the Bible. Paul the Apostle wrote to Titus, his friend, and he kind of captures everything we've been talking about in chapter two. He says, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures, turn away from that. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, and righteousness and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ will be revealed. Because He, Jesus, gave His life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and make us His very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. So we've admitted that we have a problem, or we need to admit that we have a problem and we're turned around or we're turning around and we need to keep turning around. And then next week, we're gonna begin to talk about what it means to walk in a new direction to restoration and renewal. But before we do that, I wanna lead us in a prayer of confession and repentance and receiving forgiveness from God. And to do that, I wanna wanna lead us in a, a prayer that's already been written in advance. We are borrowing Um, slash stealing this from some Lutheran churches that pray in this way to remind themselves of the forgiveness available from God. Um, My family spent a few years attending a Lutheran church when I was growing up. So part of this is like seared in my memory and it came to mind as I was preparing today. Um, Part of what we'll read in this prayer comes straight from John's letter where he talks about not fooling ourselves, 
but admitting our sin before God. So I want to invite the music team to join me on stage. They're not going to play just yet. Um, but in this, in this responsive prayer, there's parts for you to pray and Pat will lead the way and you'll read along with her in this prayer. So my part's first. My part on the screen um, in, in the next slide there, thanks, Phil, is the smaller text. Yours in this first slide is just the, the word amen. And so Pat will lead you in that and then I'll, I'll keep reading the next part of the prayer. And then we'll pause for silence, for reflection and self-examination before God. And then we'll continue on praying and there'll be more for you to pray in this responsive prayer. So I want to invite you to please stand as we do this together. My part's first, so let's pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God. We confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives all our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.